want in this uh, last session we have together to address the question of authority. Authority you could call the leader's mantle and yet the abuse of authority is one of the major criticisms that's often leveled against leaders. So I'd like to you turn your thoughts to some very important aspects of the whole, the whole area. We mentioned before that there's a difference between power and authority. And I want now to clarify what I understand by that because oftentimes these two terms are treated as though they're synonyms. Uh, they're interchangeable. There are actually two different concepts involved. First of all, let's look at this business of power. <coughs> Power is the strength of will or purpose that enables a person to get accomplished what they set out to do. It is a power, it is a strength of will or purpose that enables them to accomplish their desires or their aims, even in the face of opposition. Now they have identified a number of different kinds of power. One is called reward power. That is the power to reward behavior that the leaders consider to be, to be desirable. In some situations that may be a salary increase, it may be a promotion, it may be a special perk of one kind or another. But all leaders exercise some amount of reward power because being commended or praised or thanked by leaders is a rewarding experience to people. So whether you, whether you have the power to hire a fire or not, even in a voluntary organization, you have a certain amount of reward power in your, ha in your hands because for you to praise somebody is to them uh, and will always be a very re uh, rewarding experience. The opposite to that <coughs> is coercive power. That is the power to punish behavior or actions that leaders think are undesirable. And again, that may be the, the power in some cases to fine uh, or to disqualify uh, or to uh, move to a lower job or whatever. But all leaders exercise some form of coercive power because to be reprimanded by a leader or to be uh, rebuked by a leader or to be overlooked by a leader <coughs> is a very distressing experience. And there's a certain amount of pressure that's exercised by leaders the carrot and the stick uh, was both those kinds of power. Then there's what's called expert power. That is a power that some people have just because they're better than anybody else at doing that particular job. So the star player on the football team wields expert power. People listen to his uh, opinions with respect as far as football is concerned because he's demonstrated he's better than anybody else at playing that game. Now, as far as leaders are concerned, you do not need to be the best at everything that's going on in your organization. As a matter of fact, you don't need to be even as good as the people who are under you, except in one thing. Only one thing do you need to be the expert, and that is in leading. That's, that's your particular domain of, of expertise. Then there is what is called legitimate power. Now we consider power to be legitimate when its norms or what it stands for correspond with our own inner values. That's a very important thing to understand. We legitimize, legitimize power when, we, when its norms or its standards correspond or agree with our set of inner, standard, inner, inner values. For example, as I was walking down the road <coughs> or driving down the road in, uh, in this city, and a policeman steps out and holds his hand up, I would stop my car. Why? Because I recognize he's got power. He's got authority. And that, that, that authority is legitimate, or that power is legitimate, because what he stands for, the rights of the individual against the rights of the state, <coughs> correspond with my inner values. If I was to go to, to Soviet Russia a few years ago, and in the middle of the night, somebody knocks on my door, and there's a Russian policeman, talking about salt mines in Siberia and so on, I think that's tyranny. Now why is it tyranny? He's a policeman just like the American policeman. Does the same things. he directs traffic, he chases burglars and so on. 
Why do I, I say that's legitimate, that's not legitimate? What the Russian police stood for, or stands for, would be the power of the state over against the power of the individual. That does not agree with my inner values, which are those of a Democrat, so I'd consider that power as being legitimate. Now, in more general terms, you see, this can affect people's responses towards leadership. What I mean by that is this. <clears throat> if you take over leadership in a place <coughs> that has been accustomed to a very directive, hands-on, top-down, directive leadership, that's the model of leadership they've come to accept. If your style of leadership is very laid back, very participative, very cooperative, they are likely to say, there's no leadership around here. Nobody tells you what to do. There's no leadership, see, because what they see does not correspond with their inner values. Reverse the situation. If your style of personal style of leadership is very hands-on, directive, top-down, you go to a place that's been accustomed to a very participant, a very laid-back, very cooperative, very loose kind of leadership, they'll say what? That's authoritarianism. See, simply because there's a difference between their inner perceptions as to what leadership ought to be and what they experience, what their observation is. That's legitimate power. Now, there are all those different kinds of power. When we come to authority, we need to understand what authority is. Authority is one, the right to represent the power source. And secondly, the right to exercise the prerogatives of power. And the prerogatives of power are essentially the right to command. So you might say that authority exercises the rights of power to command, but power has to back up the commands of authority. For example, if I was to break one of the laws of this country, the likelihood might be that I was taken to court and the judge fines me $500. Now, if I don't pay the $500, I'm unlikely to find the judge on the doorstep wanting to do something about it. What I am likely to find on the doorstep is a policeman. See, the judge has got the authority, he doesn't have the power. The police has the power. I obey the judge because I know behind the judge there stands a police force who will enforce the commands of the judge if I disobey. That's the way power and authority work together. Now, it's very important for us to un understand this because, you see, authority is an economical way of producing the results of power without actually using the power just the threat of the power. Do you understand? Now that, that's, that's an important principle as far as our understanding of the, right, of the authority of the believer is concerned. What is the authority of the believer? Exactly the same thing. It is the right to represent the source of the power, that is Christ, and to exercise the prerogatives of that power without actually using the power. That is why in uh, spiritual terms, Authority is always in the name, power is in the Holy Spirit. Authority is in the name of Jesus, power is in the Holy Spirit. And authority is intended by God to produce results without God having to exercise power. Now, <clears throat> bring that down to very simple terms. Supposing in an office, for example, or a factory, here's a foreman, a supervisor, and one of his staff is disobeying, won't do what he's told. What is the foreman to do? What is the supervisor to do? First of all, he has to be ask himself, do I have the right to tell that guy what to do? In other words, he has to establish his grounds. If he's not sure of his grounds, he'll get nowhere. If he is sure of his grounds, what does he do then? Then it becomes just a matter of willpower. See? If he's confident in his authority, he just has to insist and insist and keep on insisting. And what happens if he knows what he's doing is this. The person who is disobeying the commands of the, of the supervisor will get more and more uneasy because he thinks, if I push this guy too far, 
he'll call the boss, and the boss does have the power. And if he supports the foreman, I'm on my way, on my way out. That's the way authority operates, you understand? I remember being involved uh, a few months ago in uh, a deliverance when uh, uh, we struck one of these stubborn demons, you know, the kind that said, I, you kind of not going out of here, you can't throw me out, I've been here all the time, that kind of stuff. And I said to it, in about the same level of voice I'm speaking to you now, I just want to remind you that I'm speaking to you by the word of the Lord. I'm representing Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to remind you what happens to those who disobey the word of the Lord. You know, it just went like that, see? Why? Because it was suddenly realized that God is watching over his word to perform it, see? And when I take the word of the Lord and apply the word of the Lord, and I'm confident I've got my, I'm within my authority, it creates an uneasiness, a fear. That's why it says Jesus cast out the devils with a word, see? And most of the time when they came out, they came out shrieking. Why? Because they're under moral pressure, see? Authority produces results by moral pressure. And, and the authority that's, that's exercised uh, in, in that way exercises the prerogatives of power without actually exercising the power itself. Is that concept clear? Do you, you clear what I'm saying? No. No? No. Okay, let's go back and say it again. When, uh, when God created the un universe, he gave authority to Adam and Eve over his created universe. <coughs> Genesis 1.28. What did that authority consist of? That authority consisted of Adam and Eve doing on earth what God did in heaven. God's will being done on earth the way it's done in heaven. Now they had authority to accomplish that. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were cut off from the source of their power. That's the throne of God. Therefore they can no longer maintain that authority against Satan. So Satan has come in and because Adam and Eve were living in obedience, they'd lost their authority because now they're cut off from the source of power. They lose their authority over creation, and that vacuum has been filled with the principalities of powers set up by Satan. So authority exercises the rights of power to command without actually using the power, but having at its back the power that will enforce their commands if there's any resistance. And the threat of that power is enough for authority to get its way. See? Now, when we're talking about authority, there are three basic situations where authority operates. And I want you to understand these very clearly because the way authority is exercised is different in each one. In fact, what obedience is is different in each one. And sometimes the difficulties that, that, that attach, that uh, uh, come out of the misuse of authority is because authority is used in the wrong situations. The first situation is the simple task. So we're going to talk about task authority. In task authority, there is a job to be done and one person is in charge. The other people are there who are there just to provide extra hands, extra backs, extra feet or whatever for the one mind and the one uh, will that controls the operation. All right, there's a fence to be, uh, to be uh, put up out there. The post holes have to be dug. Somebody has to, to decide there, 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 there. Go ahead and dig them. It's not the occasion for people to say, well, I don't feel really any conviction that Jesus told me to dig a post hole there. Or we haven't had a discussion yet to decide whether that's the best place to work. Somebody has to be in charge. See. Now, that is the first kind of authority you establish with your children, task authority. When your children are small, you have to be certain that they will obey you just because you tell them what to do and what not to do. You want your little boy not to go outside the garden gate and cross the road. He's too young to understand why. You have to be sure if you say, don't go outside the garden gate, he will not go outside the garden gate. That's task authority. It is the only kind of authority also that can handle emergencies. 
if this building was on fire and somebody comes rushing in and says, the place is on fire, everybody out, it's not the time to say, well, you're not in charge here, we haven't had a meeting about it yet. Besides which, I do not feel any conviction about rushing out into the cold at this moment. Somebody has to take charge. The only authority can handle that is task authority. Handling large groups of people, task authority is the only way. See. In situations like battlefield situations where communication is difficult or impossible, somebody has to say that away, and everybody goes that away because the officer says that way. See. And uh, troops are trained to respond instinctively and intuitively and unthinkingly to task authority in those situations, the only way for safety, see. Now it requires a high level of trust for that, uh, for that, to, for that to happen. There's a place for task authority also in the Christian life. It recognizes the absolute lordship of Jesus, that he's entitled to tell me to move from Australia and go and live in Iceland without giving me reasons. If he wants to give me reasons, fine. But because he's Lord, he has the right and the authority, if he wants to, to shift me without explanation. That's task authority. But if task authority is used too long, it can hold people down in levels of psychological immaturity. One of the criticisms that's made against modern uh, mass production is that, that a, a man or a woman of 30 or 40 years of age who is supposed to be a responsible adult able to make their own decisions, spends year, hours after hour after hour, week after week, just doing what they're told. You don't have to understand it, you just don't know what to do, just go and do it, mechanically, see. And uh, that holds people down in psychological immaturity. Now the second kind of authority that we face is the teaching situation. So we're going to talk about teaching authority. Now the aim in teaching authority is different from the aim in task authority. In task authority, the aim is to do, get something done. And all the person needs to know is to understand instructions. As long as they understand the instructions and do what they're told, everything will be fine. In teaching authority, the aim is not to learn to do, but to learn how to do. Therefore, explanation and argument and reasons and all the rest of it are part of the process of teaching authority. You see, the way teaching authority runs is this, operates is this. Here is a body of knowledge. Down here are a group of learners. who have no direct access on their own to this body of knowledge. Here we have the teaching authority. <coughs> who does have access to the body of knowledge and the learners have access to the teaching authority. That's why the relationship between learners and teachers is very important for the learning process. If we don't have a good relationship here, it's going to imp grossly impair uh, the people's ability to learn. And te it's, it's interesting, the, the word authority, the word author that that's based on, comes from a Latin word augure, which means to grow. And the aim of the teacher is just as simply that, to enable his people to grow, to enable the learners to grow. And he accomplishes that in two ways. One, by bringing the body of knowledge down within the reach of the learners. And that's done by simplification, explanation, illustration, example, and so on. So the teacher will repeat over and over again what he said. Do you understand that? Now I'll say it again. Do you hear what, I, what I'm saying? Here's an illustration of all that kind of stuff. See. Secondly, to bring the learner's competence up to meet the knowledge here. 
and that's done by feedback. It's done by uh, question and answer. So, you know, uh, do you understand what I say? Then tell me back in my own words. What did I say to you? Explain that back to me. See, the, the teacher wants to know that the pupil understands what he's teaching. Now, in this situation here, you see, principles and, and uh, explanations and illustrations and all that kind of stuff are part and parcel of the business of learning. And if you apply task authority to the learning situation, it won't work, or only very primitively. The only way people will learn, they'll learn by rote, they'll learn parrot fashion. No teacher would say to, to a child who is working at a mathematical sum, don't ask questions, just do it that way and it'll come out right. Exactly the way I tell you, it'll come out right. If the child questions him, I'm the teacher, you, you just do what you're told. That's not teaching, see. Now, sometimes that's all the, all the learner wants to know. He, he, he doesn't want the, the struggle of going through and understanding the principles or the background or the reasons. But the good teacher insists on that. Because you have to get a grasp of the whole principles that are involved. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is this. The aim of the teacher is that ultimately the learners are linked to that body of knowledge on their own. Okay? Now they don't need the teacher. So the aim of every teacher is to make himself redundant. The desire of every teacher is that one day his pupils will know as much as he knows. More than that, one day he will know that they will know more than he knows. They'll go on themselves to find new bodies of knowledge. That's the passion in the heart of every teacher, every true teacher. I remember some time ago getting a letter a newsletter from uh, the Association of Christian Studies in, in Australia. And uh, there was a letter uh, from, uh, in it from a university professor who was part of the, part of the, the board of this uh, foundation. And he told how he had been on, on a sabbatical. And during this sabbatical, he decided it would be uh, interesting to tackle a subject he knew nothing about. So he enrolled as a student at another university in a particular course. And he tried to explain his extreme pleasure and delight when he discovered the lecturer of that course was one of his previous pupils. And there he was sitting at the feet of his previous pupils, now learning uh, from him. Now that, that, that is the desire, I believe, of every, true, of every true teacher. And unless the teacher is willing to let the pupils go, let the learners go, give them all he understands and let them go on their own, then he's not really doing his job. And I said, I think, uh, earlier on, perhaps this morning or yesterday, sadly in the church, sometimes that doesn't happen, often that doesn't happen. That the teacher will teach the people most of what he knows, but not everything, see. Because if they know as much as he knows, then they won't need him anymore, see. And uh, the tendency has been to hold back uh, areas of knowledge to secure the authority of the teacher. That's an illegitimate use of authority, I believe. I think one of the great things that a man like John Wimber has done for the church is take the mystique out of spiritual gifts and place them where they belong in the, in, the, in the pew amongst the people. I know the early days of the renewal, you wouldn't get any of the, of the ministries around those days telling their, their, their trade secrets. No, they would do it for you, but they didn't tell you how they did it because that, was, that, that gave them their... That gave them their that gave them their, their status, their standing, their ministry. I think that's terrible, really. I say to young people, and I mean it with all my heart, I will tell you everything I know, it's all for free. Everything I know is yours for free, on one condition, that you start there. You start there. Because I believe God's after a generation of young people in the church today who will enter into all restored truth and say, that's marvelous, that'll do for starters. Now God, give us some more, see uh, the sad thing is that mostly one generation only, only recovers what the last generation has lost. I think we've got an opportunity these days to enter into all restored truth and go for more. There's much, much more than uh, any of us have dreamed. That's task authority. Teaching authority applied to the task, the task authority rather, applied to the teaching situation is inadequate. We'll never do more than people learn simple uh, rote rules. Okay, the third kind of authority is spiritual or ethical authority.
And here again the aim is different. In task authority, the aim is to do. In teaching authority, the aim is to learn how to do. In spiritual or ethical authority, or moral authority, the aim is to be. In other words, here you're speaking about character change. Now, in a sense, all authority is spiritual authority. All genuine authority is a matter of spirit. Let me show you what I mean by that. If you draw a little diagram for body, soul, and spirit, our will is a function of the soul. Our conscience is one of the functions of the human spirit. And the Holy Spirit, we know, indwells the human spirit. Now, God will do no more than tell us in our conscience what we ought to do. He will never manipulate our will. Sometimes we wish he would. Sometimes we even ask him to do it. Sometimes people come on an altar call, kind of, God, make me holy. God, change me. God won't do that. All God will do will tell us in our conscience what we ought to do. The link in here, two important links, one in there, one in there. The link in here is obedience. But you need to understand the purpose of obedience. It's not that God says, well, unless you do it my way, I'm not going to play. That's not in God's heart. See. But when we're obedient with our will to what God prompts us to do in our conscience, then through that obedience, the power of the Holy Spirit is released to reach our human will and lift our will up to the place where we not only obey, we obey willingly. That's an important distinction. Obedience as obedience is not enough to bring us blessing. I remember times in my life when God's will crossed my will, sooner or later, generally, I'd give up and say, unless I do it God's way, nothing's going to work out right. So I'd be obedient. I used to wonder why it was so sterile, why there's so little blessing in it. See? I didn't realize then that the only obedience that brings us blessing is willing obedience. See? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? God's will is done willingly in heaven. See? My problem is how do I get my will to willingly do the will of God. When I step out in obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in my conscience, I say, Lord, I, I'll do it. Then the power of the Holy Spirit reaches my will and lifts it up to a place where I discover in my heart it is a delightful thing to do the will of God. See? Listen, I never thought that I'd be able to say for me, Lord, I delight to do your will. See? I'm discovering that the most wonderful thing on earth is to do God's will. There is, listen, young people, this world has got nothing to compare with knowing that your life is in the center of God's will and seeing something of God's will being worked out through your life. I wouldn't change that for $10 million a year, see. But that, that comes out of the willingness to obey, see. Now, the other important thing is this. God wants us to obey because what God wants to give us authority. And authority has to flow out of obedience. Authority has to flow out of obedience. Because only when we're obedient to the source of the power will our authority carry any substance. If I'm not living in obedience to the throne of God, then the throne of God and God himself will not confirm my commands in his name. I'm not living in obedience. Only when I'm living in obedience will my authority have substance. Remember the time when Jesus uh, was approached by the Roman centurion uh, to, to go and heal his servant. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And the Roman centurion said, you don't need to come. He said, I also am a man under authority. He didn't say, I'm a man with authority. He said, I'm a man under authority. I say to this man, come, he come. Go, he goes. Do this, he does it. Now, why did the Roman centurion have such absolute authority over his hundred men? Because he was under authority. 
And his men knew that if they obeyed the word of the centurion, the centurion's superior officer would back the centurion up. And his superior officer would back him up. And his would back him up, all the way back to Caesar on his throne in Rome. And all the power of the Roman state stood behind that Roman centurion, ready to enforce his command with life or death if need be, as long as he stayed under authority. If he stepped out of authority, he didn't have any authority at all. No power would back it up, see. He just had the authority of his muscles, if if that that was any. So real authority is spiritual in origin. Now because of that, if you've got somebody over here, here is the leader. Here is the follower. Or if you like, the parent and the child for that matter, same thing. Will, conscience. Because authority is a spiritual thing, when it is truly exercised, it impacts on the conscience of the person towards whom it's directed. In other words, the person feels that they ought to obey that. But their will is left free to choose to obey or disobey. In other words, obedience still becomes a free choice. That's a very important principle. Bring up children, see. If parents are living under a godly authority themselves, their commands to their children will carry the weight of spiritual authority, and the child will know, I ought to do it. Now, he might be disobedient, or he might be obedient, but it's still a free choice to do that. See. When I'm living under genuine spiritual authority, I'm, I, 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 I'm not put down. I don't feel an inferior. Why? Because the, the, the choice of obeying or not obeying is still mine, right? Now the point I want to make is this. If the leaders themselves are not living under, under obedience, or the parents are not living under obedience, and they give commands to somebody else or to the child, what comes out is not spiritual authority, what comes out is willpower. And it impacts not on the person's conscience, it impacts on their will, see then you've got a conflict, see. You've got one will trying to control another will. Now I have the choice of either, either letting my will be submerged in somebody else's will and feeling less than a person, or standing up for my independence and my rights, then we've got conflict on our hands. See. That's why obedience and authority have to go together, see. Is that clear? Do you get hold of that? Now, oftentimes in an organization, I believe, many times in voluntary organizations, the reason why there's conflict between leaders and people has to do with this. There's not been, not, not real authority being exercised at all. The leader is imposing his will on his people, see. Either a force of will or a force of a strong personality or claiming a divine sanction or whatever, but it's willpower, see. It's not spiritual authority. When there, when there is uh, a true spiritual authority, obedience has to be freely given. Some of the wisest words I ever read about spiritual authority were written by a man called Menno Simons. He was one of the founding fathers of the Mennonites way back in the Middle Ages. <coughs> Menno Simons says this, Spiritual authority is never to make the rebel conform. Its only purpose is to enable the obedient person to live a holy life. Spiritual authority is never to make the rebel conform. Its only purpose is to enable the obedient person to live a holy life. Therefore, it rests on obedience and submission freely given. That's what I was saying over there. Free choice, freely given. It rests on submission and obedience freely given. It has only spiritual means at its disposal. Its only weapons are scripture, prayer, counsel, and the power of a holy life. I think that's amazing. That was written in the days when both sides of the Reformation, they burnt each other's uh, uh, protagonists at the stake and so on. Menno Simon says the only weapons that spiritual authority has are scripture, prayer, counsel, and the power of a holy life. 
Now, because of that, spiritual authority is dependent on the conviction of conscience. If a person obeys something that's not real to their conscience, they're actually not behaving morally at all. Not behaving immorally, they're behaving non-morally. This word moral or ethical means the same thing. It's used in two ways that we need to understand. Firstly, it's used descriptively to describe when a situation has a moral implications or whether it's just a matter of preference or taste. So the distinction is between moral and non-moral. For example, if I decide to have coffee instead of tea for breakfast, is that a moral decision? Is there a moral aspect to that? Just a matter of taste, or is it? We'll see in a moment. Then the, the word is used prescriptively that is it's prescribing what is right behavior and what's wrong behavior and there the distinction is between moral and immoral. When for example is a moral situation likely to arise? Whenever my actions affect somebody else, then it always has moral implications. For example, if in the morning my wife says, do you want tea or coffee for breakfast? And I know she's made tea, and out of sheer cussedness, I say, I want coffee. There is a moral aspect to it, see, because somebody else is involved. See. Moral issues are involved where our values are at stake, things we prize, justice, truth, uh, love, sympathy, and so on. And moral issues are involved where God is, is concerned even when nobody else is concerned. That's the prescriptive, the descriptive use of moral. Now, if a person is not obeying their conscience, they're actually behaving non-morally. They may conform to right social behavior, but it's not moral behavior at all. So conscience is all, all important. And we, we sometimes have to declare the truth and trust the Holy Spirit to apply that to people's conscience. And give the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit time to do that. Sometimes destructive things can happen when we try to be the Holy Spirit in people's lives. So spiritual authority must, av must avoid coercion and manipulation in all forms. either using peer pressure or the power of personality or claims to divine revelation. It has to, has to avoid that like the plague. Secondly, it has to avoid allowing people to delegate their moral responsibility upwards. very dangerous for church leaders. Because sometimes, many times, people try to do that. They'll come to you with a problem in their life and say, you're the man of God, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Never buy that one, do you? You're a woman of God, I know you hear from God, I know you're wise, just tell me what I should do in this situation. No, I buy it, do you? They're delegating their moral responsibility upwards. Never allow that, do you? You can point them to Scripture, you can give them what advice uh, you feel is right, but their decision-making must be pushed back upon their, their conscience. Now, if task authority used in a teaching situation is, is inadequate, task authority used in a spiritual situation is deadly.
It's deadly. It is the letter that kills. Paul says the Spirit gives life, the letter kills. The root of legalism most times is people applying task authority to a spiritual situation. I am the anointed shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. Don't argue, don't question it, obey it, or you're in rebellion. That may be just implied in, in attitude. Sometimes it's declared. It's deadly. And legalism kills. I remember some years ago in our church in, in New Zealand, we had uh, one of the brothers who grew up in the Plymouth Brethren. Do you have Plymouth Brethren in... in, uh, in the, it's an it's a English denomination mainly. But they have very rigid legalistic attitudes towards women speaking in the church uh, and things like that. Anyway, this, this brother was approached one day by one of the senior women in the church. He was involved in pastoral care. And she said, to he, she said to him, I was praying the other day, and I believe the Lord wants me to make myself available to you for your pastoral ministry. If there's anything I can do to help you, well, I just want to be available. I'll visit for you, I'll cook for people, I'll clean house, just anything. I just want to be available. And he said to her, well, I don't know what the other brothers would think, but personally I would have some problems on two scores. One, you're a woman. And secondly, because your husband is not one of us. She was married to a Roman Catholic man. Now this... Uh, Poor sister, it was like being hit on the head with a lump of four by two timber you didn't see coming. She was devastated. And when I saw this brother, heard about this, I got hold of this other elder. I said, what on earth did you say a thing like that to her for? And he said, well, she asked me my opinion. I told her my opinion. What's she upset about? Now, it's not that that man was insensitive. In actual fact, exactly the opposite. A very sympathetic, very empathetic, warm-hearted brother, wonderful soul winner, wonderful counsellor, but in this particular area of the ministry of women, of divided uh, families, he'd been brought up under a legalistic uh, system, and it creates a moral blindness in him, see. That, that's, that's a mark of legalism. When I preach the law, see, the difference between legalism and law is this. When I preach the law of God, I discover I'm handling a two-edged sword. It's going to cut me before it cuts you, and it will every time, see. The Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. With legalism, somehow, we can get hold of a sword, slaughter other people, and be totally unaffected ourselves. And many times, a source of legalism comes out of task authority being applied to a spiritual ethical situation. And our neglect of the fact that we have to trust the Holy Spirit to apply it to people's conscience. Okay. Right, just a couple of things uh, I want to say before uh, we finish. The exercise of authority requires, I believe, these, these important uh, provisions. Firstly, obedience. Two factors. Obedience to the power source and care for our relationship with the power source. If it's, a, if it's spiritual authority, our obedience to God and the quality of our relationship with him. Secondly, it requires a knowledge of the extent or scope of our authority. What is the extent of the authority that's been given to us? In Jesus' name. Thirdly, a growing knowledge of God's character, God's purposes, and God's ways. Oftentimes we fail. We think, well, God's given us a carte blanche, given us authority, and we to go out and try to exercise that without any understanding of the scope of that authority or the character and the purposes or the ways of God that we represent. And fourthly, confidence in these things. One, confidence to act or decide or command. You've got authority, it has to be used. You've got to have the confidence to act or command or decide on the basis of that authority. Secondly, confidence in the decisions or commands we've made, that we've got it right. And thirdly, confidence that Christ will back up our commands or back up our decisions and enforce them if need be. In other words, that we really have the word of the Lord and God will watch over that word to, to, word to perform it. 
And if we have that confidence, then it means sticking to our rights, sticking to our commands, and holding those against the situation, against the devil's authority, against whatever is there, uh, until that authority has its effect. Okay, any questions just before we close? I think the, the need to identify the, the situations we're in and the type of authority we're exercising is critical in the church. The basic authority of the church is actually teaching authority. Okay. Uh, not quite sure. Could you explain that? In other words, uh, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of say, a legalistic system and the imposition of, uh, of law. Mm. And kind of so it's disregarding the spirit of the imposition of the letter of the law. Yeah. But uh, true authority ministers grace. And not, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not an imposition. It's mm. uh, Yeah, I think, I think that, that's right. Uh, what I was trying to express that in the sense that, that uh, legalism is the, the imposition of task authority to a spiritual situation, you know, the letter of the law, if you like. Authority is liberating because it still leaves our obedience to be a free response. It's something we choose to do. Teaching authority. Yeah, yeah. Is there a time for the use of task authority in a newborn Christian? Is, is there a progression that needs to take place in the way you, you uh, use authority? The, the, uh, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to reflect on it. I think there may be, uh, in, in very simple, essential things, if you've got somebody whose will, for example, has been uh, totally in bondage, uh, uh, and for that will to be freed, even to make intelligent responses, they, they may need to be under an authority that says, you know, uh, don't do this and don't do that. Uh, that's going to be bad for you. Understand later on, but, but uh, uh, don't do that. But I think that's very early, very emergency stuff, that as soon as possible, it's got to get onto at least a teaching level where the person understands the reasons for it. And we need, even in that situation, to be able to be questioned, uh, you know, why, see, and give the reasons. Uh, and then proceed from there onto spiritual authority where we're addressing the, the person's conscience. Okay, thanks. So.